Well, welcome everyone to CG webinar stroke seminar number 361. Uh, and um, we've got a special we special webinar today with uh, Bill Opback and Hans DeWitt. Uh, the title is Trends in Internationalization of Higher Education in a Time of Geopolitical Turmoil. Um, I'll introduce our presenters in a moment, but let me take you through the webinar protocols. Remember that the um, webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube uh, channel and you'll be able to access that through our CG website as well. Uh, and I would expect it to be up because our, 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 our main communications officer is currently on annual leave. I expect we'll post it next Monday. Um, now, during the webinar, we advise you to keep your sound off, keep muted because extraneous noise does crowd in to the webinar. You don't need to use your camera either, but of course we want you to turn on both your microphone and your camera when you take part in our Q&A. We advise you to use speaker view, which is in the top right-hand corner of the screen there, uh, which enables you to see who's speaking at any given moment in the webinar. Now to enter the discussion section, and we usually run at least 20, 30 minutes of discussion in the second half of the webinar, um, use the chat function, post your comment or your question for our presenters in the chat, and that will enable me to identify who's interested in coming into on camera. And, um, and then I'll be able to compose you into the Q and A section of the webinar. And I tend to, of course, take people in the order in which they come in. So it's a good idea to come in early if you want to take part. Um, if you post your comment or your question late, like the last five or 10 minutes, you might miss out because we could have a full set of Q&A participants by then. Um, and now when it comes to the, the moment that you come onto camera, I'll send you a message just before that uh, in, in the chat, a kind of private message in the chat. Um, but when, when it comes to the moment of you entering, you, of course, turn on your mic um, and turn on your camera if you can. and then. Um, tell us who you are, where you're from, and then come out with your statement or your question. Now, our presenters. Well, um, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, the first two directors of the Boston College Centre for International Higher Education, which is, I think, you know, been the most important centre for discussion and circulation of information about international higher education in the world in the last three decades. Phil Altback, Research Professor and Distinguished Fellow at the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. He was the Monon University Professor at Boston College from 1994 to 2015. And he was also the Distinguished uh, Scholar Leader of a most fruitful program, the um, New Century Scholars Initiative for the Fulbright um, Program, which is uh, brought together a group of people which have subsequently played a major role as scholars and sometimes as, as leaders in higher education since that time. Phil's got a long pedigree. He's taught in Harvard, um, University of Wisconsin, um, State University of New York in Buffalo. He did his own degree, um, de degrees, all three, at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, he's, of course, a prolific author. Uh, I think the most cited person in our field worldwide um, with uh, many books and articles. Um, with him, we have another very prolific author and both uh, uh, Hans and Phil comment regularly in public forums such as University World News on the sector. Uh, Hans uh, was the second director at Boston College, Professor Emeritus and Distinguished Fellow at, uh, in, at, at Boston and um, Prior to that, he was director of the Center for Higher Education and Internationalization at Universita Cattolica Sacro Chiore in Milan. And earlier than that, at University of Amsterdam, University of Applied Sciences, uh, uh, sorry, Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, Vice President of International Affairs of the University of Amsterdam. Um, he, um, again, many articles, many books, um, very active in Europe, uh, as well as worldwide, uh, Senior Fellow of the International Association of Universities, IAU, uh, founding member and past president of the European Association for International Education. And of course, 
founding editor of the Journal of Studies in International Education, which is the leading journal in the field of international higher education. Um, has also has more uh, on the on the on the publication list and the editorial list, but I mean both both of our presenters, of course, have long CVs. I won't take it any further because we need the time for them. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Phil, who I think will be leading off. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's a, a pleasure to participate in this very fruitful, long series now of uh, the CG um, uh, uh, seminars, uh, which I think are one of the important points of communication in our whole field. So thank you, Simon, for inviting us. Uh, Hans and I are speaking to you today from uh, Dublin, Ireland. We thought we, sh we should be kind of in the middle of the Atlantic uh, talking across, uh, across borders because we're at a, a, a conference uh, here together. Um, uh, what I want to do is to take um, a relatively short period of time as a way of introduction uh, to give you a sense, which I think many of you uh, in this uh, in this audience of higher education professionals probably already know most of. So I'm going to be really brief and give you the um, kind of the, the 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 brief talking points on on these issues. And so I want to remind us first of what are the fundamental principles of higher education uh, developments really uh, in the post. Um, Second World War period, uh, all of that in about four minutes, and then I, then I want to simply cite the um, what I think are the main geopolitical uh, challenges that the world faces today. Uh, some talk about our being at a quote inflection point unquote. I'm not so sure about that, but certainly uh, the points which I'm going to be making were. I, I wouldn't have made even a year or so ago. So we have a number of points which I think are quite central to, to this debate. And then Hans will um, uh, talk about internationalization uh, and uh, uh, challenges and interests there, um, which of course he is a, the, the global expert on. So first of all, um, I think there are two key uh, underlying facts of global higher education. And they're both a little bit uh, contradictory with each other. The first, of course, is massification and the humongous huge increases we've seen uh, over the last decades in student numbers and numbers of institutions and so on. Now there are more than uh, two, 200 million students in post-secondary education and nobody knows how many universities and post-secondary institutions that exist around the world. Uh, you know, uh, they're in the, in, the, in the numerous millions now. Uh, and by the way, and this is an important general point, uh, more or less half of them are private institutions, which is one of the big uh, changes. So massification is brought with it, as I mentioned, the rise of the private sector. It's brought with it the development of diversified higher education systems and institutions, which we can see around the world, higher education no longer is one size fit, fits all, and that all was an elite. It now uh, fits many, many different purposes and different student uh, 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 populations. Uh, we've seen the privatization of the public sector, which I think is a, a serious problem, but a key reality uh, in almost every country in the world, maybe with Northern Europe being the main exception uh, to that to, to, the, to that rule. Uh, and we've of course seen hugely increased opportunities for young people uh, to obtain a post-secondary education uh, and to obtain also social mobility as a result. So that's the massification. The other side of that coin, of course, is we are now all part of, a glo of the global knowledge economy and globalization is a key uh, uh, factor in higher education, even in the era of populism and nationalism, the global globalization is very much uh, around and in my view will continue to be uh, uh, despite political trends, 
for a long time. We've seen the globalization of science. We've seen the development of re research universities and their importance uh, around the world. Um, uh, we've seen the rise of rankings with all of their, generally speaking, unfortunate elements. Um, we can go into that a bit if you want to in the Q&A. We've seen the dramatic increase in mobility of students and faculty uh, uh, globally uh, and the development of an internationalization kind of industry. And I think Hans will talk a little bit about that. So that's, that's the reality. And we've also seen, of course, that science itself has become, become uh, globalized. So let me spend uh, uh, the, the time I have remaining, five minutes or so, uh, on what I think are some of the crisis points which underlie a lot of these uh, issues. Nowadays, and, and this, is, this is quite new actually, uh, with the, with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s and a general feeling of good you know, uh, uh, development uh, China join, joining the, uh, uh, the international world of higher education. Most of us were feeling pretty good about the way that higher education in general uh, and international contacts and developments were, uh, were, were, were proceeding. We saw Erasmus, we saw the large number of EU programs. So all of this was going well. And then it collapsed. Well, I shouldn't say it collapsed. It declined, and we are in a period of decline. We've seen, first of all, now maybe not, we've seen Brexit, which is a, an indication of uh, 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 problems, and also the exit of one of the most important scientific and, so, and student mobility uh, countries in the world, the UK. Uh, we've seen the, uh, the war in Ukraine and basically the withdrawal of, uh, of, of Russia from the international higher education uh, scene. And I think the challenges uh, and difficulties of the Ukraine war and the exit of Russia from the global higher education will be with us for quite a period of time going forward, no matter what happens with Ukraine. And I, don't, I personally don't see much good news on that front at all. We've seen the rise of, of uh, populism and nationalism in quite a number of countries. Uh, I must re uh, reference my own country, the United States, first and maybe foremost, since we are a very large uh, player on the international scene. Uh, Mr. Trump and his administration, which may well be back with us uh, after the elections next year, um, had a an influence, not a profound influence, I would say, but a significant influence on uh, America's role in global science uh, and in higher education and certainly in our image. But we've also seen the rise of, of uh, such uh, a, a nationalism and populism in other countries. Um, there, the, the election in Turkey just a couple of weeks ago is an underlining of that uh, uh, factor, uh, Hungary, uh, uh, also, we saw the Bolsonaro regime, regime in Brazil, and one could go on and on. These developments, which are endemic in the world, not everywhere, but in a significant number of countries, are very important and very indicative of, a, uh, of, of global reality today and play an impact on, uh, 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 on, on higher education. We see also in terms of geopolitical challenges, the decoupling, especially of the United States and China, but maybe a little bit more broadly, the West uh, from China also, certainly not as serious and I don't think as fundamental as the uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, with, with Russia, but uh, from both sides of the American and the Chinese uh, scene, we, we see this uh, the, this this kind of uh, development. Um, uh, we, we have a new demographic reality, not in every country, but in a number. And we see that uh, enrollments are actually declining in a number of countries because of declines in the population, demographic realities. Uh, and that will play a role on internationalization going forward. So far, 
not so clear how that's going to play out, but it'll 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 be important. A number of countries are increasingly dependent on international students because there are simply not enough domestic students. This is true in parts of the United States and a number of other countries. So Japan, uh, Korea is the champion country for a declining birth rate right now globally, and so on. So democracy, de demography plays a significant role. The impact of COVID will play a role. There has been some research on this. My own view, and I don't know what my colleague Hans de Witt thinks about this, uh, my own view is that the impact of COVID is less fundamental than many people thought, probably including us, uh, during the COVID crisis itself. But it will play it will play a role. One thing that COVID has did was it in, increased the usefulness, sophistication uh, of of uh, distance education. So these systems work better than they did, and us folks in the universities. Uh, professors and, and especially students are more used to using distance education. At the same time, we have seen fundamentally that people don't like it. They much prefer face-to-face -face teaching, communication, mobility, and so on. But there's COVID uh, uh, out there. We're now seeing the debate and reality of uh, artificial intelligence and the IT revolution in general which has going, been going on for some time, but with AI has put all these both discussions. And I think in the, in the period, coming period, the realities um, on steroids. Um, and finally, we see the impact of the climate crisis and sustainability in general. And I have to say as a bit of a pessimistic person that I see lots of debate and discussion about the climate crisis, but in terms of internationalization, and in fact, in terms of the responses of universities, relatively little action. So are we at an inflection point? I don't know. Are we at a point of reconsideration and crisis? Definitely. And with that, I want to turn over the floor to Hans de Witt. OK, thank you, uh, Phil. And thank you, Simon, for inviting us uh, and uh, see so many people uh, joining us uh, at this uh, panel. Um, Phil has provided the international higher education context, and I will focus on internationalization of higher education. Uh, we had in the conference with all, uh, at the Center for International Higher Education last week with Simon also gave the uh, Philip Albach uh, lecture, the first inaugural Philip Albach lecture. Uh, we had uh, some discussion about what is the difference between international higher education and internationalization of higher education, and we could have an interesting discussion about that. Uh, but let me... Uh, make the PowerPoint if it works uh, available. Uh, I will try to be uh, short on that, but want to give you some kind of reflections on the past and then focus on uh, what does it mean in the current context. Uh, so I will say what are the main trends and rationales and drivers over the past decades, what different perceptions we have and meanings of internationalization and what is the future direction. These are the three themes. Uh, first of all, uh, Internationalization of higher education basically started from uh, a very uh, practitioner point of view. People in the field of offices of international education trying to understand what does it mean what we are doing and how are we going to do it and what are we going to do. So if you look at 1996, Ulrich Teichler uh, wrote that international education research was basically occasional, coincidental, sporadic and episodic. Uh, and that reflected very much the time that it was. And although in the 10 years later, he and Barbara Kemp said that it had become more multidimensional and multifaceted and intertwined with research on other aspects, so mainstreaming, as they called it, uh, and the Journal of Studies in International Education in 1997 uh, created a kind of scholarly debate. Uh, so that's in itself seeing an evolution taking place. If you look now at... Uh, higher education journals, internationalization is probably the most written, uh, published uh, themes in those journals. And there are many books, blogs, and webinars. But at the same time, I still think that, as uh, Jenny Lee and uh, Steinach, like I have said in 2021, there is a 
very under theorization of the field of internationalization of higher education. So we still are very much in understanding uh, practices, but not having a kind of conceptual and contextual view. So that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, if you look at the meaning of internationalization, and in a previous webinar uh, a time ago, uh, Simon was uh, talking about the definition of Jane Knight in 1993 and updated in 2003, uh, that definition basically changed from what it was before that before the 1990s. Then it, we called it not internationalization of higher education, but we called it international education. And that was a very fragmented list of activities, study abroad, international student recruitment, internationalization of the curriculum, but there was no process of coherent approach. In that sense, uh, Jane Knight's definition, which still are very much cited, was an important uh, development because it made it moving away from ad hoc and fragmented into a process approach. But as we have seen, and also Simon has been talking about correctly, uh, it left a lot of room for different approaches to an understanding of what we mean with internationalization, including more and more emphasis on the competitive uh, forms of marketization, etc., that uh, Phil talked about. So in itself, it was a good development, but uh, we still see that internationalization is very much an ongoing and fragmented reality uh, in its meaning. And it's still very much dominated by this commercialization and the mobility side. So there were a lot of what I wrote, uh, misconceptions about what is internationalization and unintended consequences and myths. And even to the extent that Uwe Brandenburg and I wrote already in 2011, maybe we have to look at the end of internationalization at this because it doesn't really reflect what are the normative dimensions to it. Uh, but we can say that over the past half century, internationalization has evolved from a very marginal ad hoc range of activities to more comprehensive uh, processes and policies. It has become a key strategic agenda for universities and national and international governments around the globe. Uh, if you look at a survey like the International Association of University does, uh, more than two thirds of in institutions of higher education around the world have an international strategy. Governments have internationalization strategies, uh, international organizations, the OECD and the World Bank and UNESCO uh, with a lot of attention to it. But it is driven still by a very diverse range of rationales and program strategies and a lot of uh, st stakeholders and resulting by that in a very many different approaches and actions uh, of what internationalization uh, means. It, if you look back to what are the key developments in my view, education abroad, so the whole mobility side, mobility of students, mobility of faculty, mobility of programs and institutions is still more driving the agenda than internationalization at home, the internationalization of the curriculum and teaching and learning process. There's an increasing focus on international rankings that rule and favor some over others in the internationalization dimension, because it's very much focused on that mobility dimension. The divide between the North and the South and between those universities classified as top world-class universities and the others still persist. So there is still a strong division and equality in internationalization uh, between the North and the South and between research universities and world-class universities and other types of institutions. Internationalization has increasingly become synonym to competition and marketization and moving away from the traditional values of cooperation, exchange, and service to society. Inequality and exclusiveness, uh, both nationally and internationally, has been approached, and internationalization has become, in that sense, a very elitist approach. And that has increased even more over the past uh, decades and during the COVID. And recognition of its importance is still at the institutional level, although we pay a lot of lip service in policy documents and institutions, etc., is still very low and is increasingly uneven. There are institutions that really have internationalization as a high point in the reality and in the mission, and others not. But that first group is still very small compared to the large majority. We saw a counter-reaction to this whole 
commercialization and, uh, uh, and focus on mobility and movements like the internationalization at home uh, in 1999 uh, um, and further developed and defined by people as Dos Ben and Elspeth Jones. Of course, the internationalization of the curriculum, in particular in Australia and the UK, as a reaction to the whole focus on recruitment of international students, uh, people like Betty Lisk, comprehensive internationalization in the United States, and they were a kind of reaction to this focus on mobility. Also, we have seen recently more attention to internationalization of research and internationalization of higher education for society as looking at the two other missions of higher education, research and service to society, because internationalization from a practitioner point of view was mainly focused on the educational side and not on the other two dimensions. And these have become more and more important also because of the developments that Phil has de uh, described as uh, increasing inequality, uh, climate, uh, health, and all the other SDGs that have been uh, uh, higher on the center. So in my view, internationalization has two dimensions, multifaceted. It's, so it has a lot of different uh, dimensions to it. It is an own, the, uh, evolving process. Uh, and you can say even that applies to the other aspects of it. If we talk about study abroad, people have completely different meanings of what study abroad is in different contexts. Uh, same, what is an international student? We have degree students, we have uh, uh, credit students, we have students for certificate programs, we have them from different uh, uh, funding mechanisms, etc. We, we all talk and research about international students, but not understanding the diversity in it. The same with internationalization at home. Is it the same as internationalization of the curriculum, for instance? We talk about transnational cross-border education, a lot of variety in that. Digitalization, uh, virtual mobility, virtual exchange, collaborative online learning, global citizenship, also an other term meant. So internationalization has become a kind of umbrella term which covers us and that is uh, everything, but doesn't mean uh, much. But uh, there is not one model that fits all. Internationalization is very much context related and we have to keep that in, in mind when we talk about it. So it's a major obstacle that we talk about internationalization without being very clear on what we mean. At the same time, we mix internationalization of higher education with internationalization in higher education. We are, in my view, internationalization of higher education is more the conceptual uh, dimension to it, and it's very close to international higher education, but internationalization in higher education reflects much more the activities, the practice of it. And you can even go on that there was a lot of discussion about global higher education, international higher education, what is the difference, et cetera, et cetera, international education or internationalization. Uh, but we use those terms without really having a common, clear meaning of what we mean. So what I see as a problematic sloppiness, mixing and confusing the why we are internationalizing internationalization, what are we really doing in programs and actions? How are we organizing it? And what is the impact to, with whom we're doing it? So the partners and in where, the whole context. And we should be much more clearer, in my view, uh, what are we talking about when we talk about internationalization? And maybe even get at a certain moment away from that term because it is too broad and too fake. So there is a need for change, a need for change moving away also from this elitist and competitive and market-oriented approach to internationalization and looking much more at what it means into the qualitative dimensions of internationalization. We reflected that in a new, a new definition, um, internationalization, uh, much more focused on inclusion, much more focused on uh, mobility only as an integral part of the curriculum, and uh, re-emphasizing internationalization of the goal in itself when it means to enhance quality, and not focus solely on economic rationales. I'm not saying that economic rationales are not important, but they should not be the driving rationale. And so in 2015 already, we defined the, the extended the definition of J Knight from 2003 to make it an intentional process in order to enhance the quality of education and research for all students and staff. So not making it elitist and to make a meaningful contribution to society. That was a, different, a new definition which we developed on the request of the European Parliament and based on the Delphi exercise with experts around the world. 
You can say this is a very normative approach to internationalization, where Jane Nye's definition was basically what she correctly calls a working definition, a working definition describing what is happening, where we say, but it's, yeah, it's nice that they describe that, but if everybody gets a different meaning out of it, we're not reaching everywhere. So we have to give it a normative direction as reflected also in other terms that is labeling internationalization over the past year. Comprehensive, intelligent, ethical, conscientious, responsible, humanistic, learner-centered, forced, etc. All kind of nice label, but we've tried to bring that together in one clear definition that gives us a clear direction for where we have to be. And that's even more needed now in the current situation. Uh, I skip this because I basically say that's the happening in the same kind of other areas. So we said we need a changing paradigm. And although, the, of course, there is a lot of talk about uh, the changing paradigm in documents, we still think that it is mainly not happening. But you see, luckily enough, a lot of new developments happening uh, in internationalization and whole new generation of scholars is, is developing new research uh, with also a very important focus on that internationalization is not a Western paradigm, but is something that uh, has to be interpreted in the context of different uh, relations and also taking into account the importance of decolonizing internationalization, uh, a topic which importantly is uh, needed to be debate and we can have a lot of discussion about it. We had that also in the conference last week in, in Boston. Uh, what do we mean with uh, decolonization? Uh, but it is an important part that we continue the work as Simon also expressed in his uh, introduction and remarks um, of intellectual lecture, uh, building on the work that has been done already long before by people like uh, Philip Albach, that we have to look into what does decolonization in the current context mean. So the changing global uh, environment uh, is, in my view, also affecting very much the importance of internationalization of higher education. Uh, geopolitical developments and tensions are really challenging the internationalization of higher education. Phil already mentioned that. And we, uh, we have to keep the channels open. We cannot suddenly say that by the fact that governments do stupid things like, uh, and terrible things even, like the invasion in, in Ukraine, that that means that all the Russians are very bad. That we have to keep channels open with our, with our Russian colleagues who are also in the same path as we are. Uh, that's very important. We have to keep those channels open, as, as Simon has said, uh, with China. That's very important. So we have to look into the right balance between, on the one hand, our values and principles like academic freedom, uh, but uh, at the same time, we should not isolate ourselves from what is happening in China, what is happening in Russia, and what is happening elsewhere, and find the, the right people to work with to make still the international collaboration very important. We, of course, we see increased competition for global talent, but also there we have to say to governments and institutions of higher education in the Western world that recruit international students uh, and, for, and increasingly do that for stay rates so that they can work in the labor force in our countries, what are the ethical consequences of that policy? Huh? They are probably as bad as the revenue generation rationale for recruiting international students because we brain drain them from their countries to our side. And we have to at least discuss this kind of issues because the, the, the COVID uh, impact and other health issues will be important. The other sustainable development goals, nationalism, racism, they all have a direct impact of the way we are internationalizing higher education. So that I think it's important for us to keep the debate open. How can we break, make internationalization from a much more competitive to a collaborative environment and to serve to society? That is, I think, in the current geopolitical context, the most important one. And with that, I um, end my presentation. I look in particular very much forward to have conversation because debate and conversation brings us further. Thank you very much. And thank you both. I mean, just wonderful to have that that overview. Um, the um, and I appreciate um, Hans's uh, attempt to put clarity, you know, into our understanding of um, internationalisation, including 
conceptual clarity. And it's a very formidable task, isn't it? Because you remember the work on higher education by Clark Kerr as early as 1962, three. I mean, I think still the best book on the university and, and certainly in the Western context and perhaps overall, Clark Kerr's The Uses of the University. And he says, it's irreducibly multiple and complex. Um, higher education has so many roles, so many missions, so many constituencies, agendas, uh, so many interest groups it serves in society. And that was in, in the 60s, in the, in the 1960s. We had Ron Barnett talking about super complexity as an attempt to try and get to grips with this. And then we go to international. And of course, international is more complex again, because not only the com multiplicity and complexity of one national system is in play, but the multiplicity and complexity of the world's higher education systems, plural, is in play. So very formidable task, but um, worth doing, absolutely worth doing. Um, I'm going to ask one question. We've already got, I think, four people coming in after that. Um, and I encourage uh, others who want to ask questions to come forward now, because I think we're going to have a full board pretty quickly. Um, I've got one quick question, though, and it's really, I think it's responding to something Phil said, but it's probably more for Hans. Um, Western Europe, three countries, France, Norway, uh, Finland recently, recently moved from, you know, from largely free or entirely free approach to international students to charging fees to non-Europeans, uh, went into the commercial mode uh, and uh, perhaps to the regret of many um, and perhaps more pertinent in a way to what Phil said, um, in uh, Denmark and the Netherlands, there's been a lot of pushback against international students in some respects, at least a desire to put limitations on programs serving international students, a certain amount of rhetoric about too many international students and so on particularly in the relation to Denmark and Netherlands, which of course are liberal and open societies, which really encourage mobility generally. Um, I mean, how do you explain this, Hans? And, and what do you think is the remedy for the sector? How can we, if you like, keep the border more open in those countries? Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm pretty sure Phil would also have an opinion, maybe to slightly will disagree on me. On the first part briefly about what happens in France and uh, Norway and in, in Finland, and uh, basically following a trend which was already happening elsewhere uh, to charge full cost fees to international uh, students from outside of the ER. Uh, my personal view is that in itself, there's not an logic to do that. Uh, uh, because why would the, the Norwegian taxpayer, to give that example, uh, and I know the Norwegian context uh, reasonably well, uh, why would they pay for, uh, for the fees for international students from the taxpayer's money? But what my problem with those countries and with all the countries is that go to full cost fees is that they don't use that money for scholarships for students who really need it. So if there's not a policy to create to, to use that revenue from uh, children from rich parents uh, for uh, allowing access to, for poor students to come, then I think it becomes indeed uh, questionable if that is a wise policy. So, and that's what I see missing. That's also part of the whole debate in, in, in a country like Norway that there has not been given in a country which is extremely rich and profits from all the gas prices uh, in the rest of Europe, uh, why that money is not used for that kind of purpose. Then you are, in my view, going into the ethically wrong direction. Uh, on the Dutch and the uh, Danish case, uh, I think the big mistake that institutions of higher education and governments in the past have made is that they saw um, international students uh, too much as a kind of uh, solution to both funding and to uh, uh, reduce of uh, local student numbers in, in all kinds of disciplines and to, to keep certain disciplines going. Instead of then cutting the disciplines, they said, well, we bring in the international students. So if they would have been focused on where there is an, uh, really a potential at the master level and the PhD level and certain um, disciplines like the arts, which are by nature in, in the Netherlands very international, then I think it makes sense. But if you are teaching in English in psychology and other disciplines just to have international students, then the pressure in housing, the pressing in, in quality of education, um, the resistance from nationalist point of view, et cetera, became too dominant. So 
uh, they have been going to the extreme in, uh, in, in recruiting international students. And that uh, creates all kinds of assistance within the institutions of higher education, between institutions of higher education, because the, the ones in the big cities in Amsterdam and Rotterdam and et cetera, and Utrecht, they have too many international students. And then in the countryside, they have far less. Uh, so you create all kinds of tensions and you create tensions in media and in the political science. So the current Minister of Education in that sense has done a very nice balanced approach to say, well, we have to reduce it and to make international programs in English much more effective. And we have to uh, also uh, break the dominance of the English language in higher education by forcing international students also to, to learn Dutch, etc. Uh, in this way, hoping that he can keep the channels open because he is uh, very much in favor of international collaboration, internationalization, but he also puts, feels all the pressure that we have gone to the extreme. And that's what, uh, and, and Denmark, there's also the whole Im the immigration factor much more important that even they go too far because they say that international students can only be there for the labor force in the, in the Danish market and otherwise you cannot have them. And that is my view, as I said before, an unethical issue. But it is, uh, uh, I, I think we need to have a more, more balanced approach. Um, I, I just like to underline a, a couple of things that Hans said. I don't disagree at all with any of it. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is, is um, uh, his point about um, uh, international students' uh, tuition which neither of us think that international students should pay more than uh, the actual cost of their instruction, but the, what international students uh, from wealthy families can subsidize international students from poorer families. I think yep. that's what Hans was saying, and nobody does that. And it would be a very interesting and we think important kind of uh, innovation. Some countries, uh, the, the uh, some institutions in the United States, and I think uh, some in, in uh, I may be wrong here, some in Australia and the UK, um, charge more money for international students than they do for other for, for students in, in the domestic market. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a bad idea, uh, definitely. So, and in general, using international students as what we call cash cows, which lots of countries are now doing, that's terrible. And that's very common. Yes, and that's a topic we could go, go on about at length. Um, I appreciate what both of you said, uh, and spe especially the need to, be, to take a more nuanced and complex view than the political debate often does. Um, now, we begin the Q&A proper, if you like, and I'm going to bring people in two at a time because we've already got a lineup of about 10 or so wanted to come in. So we'll start with uh, Michael Wolf, and then I'll go straight to Agung Nakaroho uh, after Michael, and then ask our presenters to respond. Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you for the talk and, <clears throat> excuse me, and hello to my old friend Hunt. And this may not be so much a question as a kind of extended moaning, a uh, short moaning. Well, it, to my mind, the real issue is when comprehensive internationalization began, was linked to quality. And I still think that's the, the a problem to standards because the, the notion of comprehensive internationalization, as we know, was invented in Washington DC in two organizations and AFSA and A's. And it's a very expensive um, standard to meet in many different ways. And I can see why when we think about decolonization that we really need to separate the question of quality and internationalization. Regionalism is also valuable. Localism, if you like, is also valuable. So why we're, we're prioritizing as, as a sign of quality an American, American and Western Europe, Australian as well as standard, that seems to me to wreak a little bit of neo-colonialism. I'll end my rant. Thanks, Michael. Uh, can we be bringing Agung at this point? Agung, are you there, please? Thank you, Simon. Thank you, uh, Hans David, and thank you, Philip Alba. First of all, my name is Agung. I would like to say thank you very much for this opportunity for me asking questions. I also would like to say that in my last dissertation 
like three of you, Simon, Hans, DeWitt, and Philip Arbor, have been used as my references in writing and finishing my, uh, my uh, presentation. So my question would be like, we know that internationalization has been very crucial in the development of uh, higher education in the global context. Like the way I see internationalization has been very beneficial for Western, especially uh, global North uh, universities in global North, because it can bring us, uh, Alba just mentioned, Philip just mentioned that uh, it can also be a cash cow. Well, on the one hand, cash cow is bad, but in reality, cash cow is something that can create um, what you call advantage for university to, to develop after they become uh, private instead of going, you know, from the government. And the way I see, although internationalizations have been very crucial for the development, but this program uh, cannot be applied in all countries. Like in my dissertation, I, I tried to take a look at the Indonesian context, for instance. Like one of the, uh, one of the, uh, what do you call it? One of the ideas of internationalization is like, well, it claims that internationalization can be a project to develop institutions according to the strength. That's on the one hand. However, on the other hand, when we see that some of the, some of the countries, including Indonesia, they, they develop internationalization according to uh, global league tables and rankings, which as we know that these kind of rankings create you know, exclusiveness and somehow uh, differences between what the Western universities can do and the global universities in the Eastern uh, countries, such as Indonesia. Like, I still remember one of the uh, disadvantages that uh, can be uh, experienced by Indonesian universities if they try to follow or try to compete in the global university rankings. Like, I remember uh, in one of your book, Philip Albach, you, you, you mentioned that the national circular pattern in which when we try to somehow compete with the uh, other international universities that have been listed on the global university rankings, they already have scientists, they already have uh, what you call a researchers with high citation, citation. But in Indonesia, although we can produce uh, our research and publish in international journal, but do we get the citations as much as they do? So will, will that be even relevant? So basically internationalization can be a good point at one time, but if this is based on the development of universities according to global university rankings, that will just you know, put these universities in, in the far left behind positions compared to those in Western countries with more stable in terms of the research intensive university than those in the Eastern context. And my question would be that I wrote down there, so if there are different conceptions between internationalization in the Western concept, uh, in the Western countries and the, in, the, in, the, in Eastern countries, or in this case, Global South, so what would be the best alternatives for the uh, universities in the Global South if they want to somehow develop their institutions according to the project of internationalization? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, and thank you, can I say and Michael. Um, Phil, you can take it first if you want. Yeah, well, very, very brief comment. Um, uh, it is definitely up, not our responsibility or even should we uh, answer your question because it's up to you, please not now, uh, to answer that question. Uh, um, I, I, while you were talking, I was the international uh, internationalization debates from the global south should be from the global south, not from us guys uh, sitting in Dublin or Boston or Amsterdam. Um, and I think there needs to be a robust development of um, new thinking from your end on how you think about these issues, the issues broadly of uh, um, uh, decolonization and so on. So I think that's, that's the kind of request I would have uh, of, uh, some of our colleagues on this uh, on on the seminar. Yeah, and I, I agree with. That. I mean, I mean that's indeed we we should, we, uh, we have to be careful that we are not telling you what you should do. That that's very essential, and it relates a little bit also to the to the first question by uh, by Mike Wolf about what is quality, etc. Uh, of course, uh, we we as academics all over the world have some clear values what we are considering as what is good quality education. But if it would be a kind of Western definition of quality, 
uh, related to what you uh, described in your question about rankings, etc., uh, then we would impose uh, our uh, values to you. Uh, you have to identify what does internationalization mean in your specific context and how you can operate in that, and even uh, not copying. Um, a, a few years ago, we did a pro project for the World Bank on what internationalization means for countries in uh, what we would better call lower mid-income countries than the Global South. Uh, uh, and uh, we discovered that many governments and even institutions were just copying what we in the West were doing. They wanted to recruit international students for, they wanted to uh, uh, to be high in the rankings by uh, uh, recruiting international students, and international faculty, etc. They didn't develop their own strategies for internationalization within their context. Uh, I think that's very important to do. And you have now opportunities to do that because we see that if we take the mobility still as the driving agenda, that uh, we in the Western world have immediately after COVID come back uh, to the old habit of we want to recruit international students. We want to have more students from, from the global south. The reality is that the patterns are completely changing. And the students from Africa don't go to the global north anymore. They go to uh, other countries in Africa. They go to Malaysia. They go to China. They go to India. Uh, we saw uh, even how many students from Sudan during the conflict were in Egypt. How many students from uh, Africa uh, were in Ukraine during the war, uh, when the war broke out and cut? So the whole pattern is already changing and you should do it on your own way, uh, making use of your possibilities and not copying what we are doing. Well, this is a discussion that could run and run, I suspect. And I want to thank Agun for that really well put together question uh, and, and invite you Agun to come on to our webinar program in future and present around those issues yourself. I think we really appreciate the chance to discuss it further with you. I'm, I'm also aware of the time and I think we need to bring some more people into the discussion. So I'm going to invite two more, um, Herminia Alonso and David Mills. Uh, Herminia, please. Um, thank you very much, Simon. Um, thank you, Philip and Hans. It would be really useful to, to understand your views um, from universities in the West and looking at internationalization uh, and all the debate uh, that, that is happening and all the latest, latest developments. Um, and if we were to start with a blank, blank canvas, that is impossible, but we can dream there is a blank canvas where we are going to design the perfect internationalization uh, and how universities should go about it. Um, it would be useful to get your views on what is it that universities in the West should do? Uh, what should they concentrate on to, uh, to internationalize successfully? Thanks, Herminia. And can we bring in David Mills? Hi, both. Um, Phil Hans, it's really interesting. Great review. Um, I'm going to ask the opposite question, really, which is, why are we still stuck on trying to define these things? And, you know, what is our attachment to a sort of sense of, if only, if only our education could be this internationalist sort of project, which was equal and global? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, it is part of the reason we're attached to this normative culture, partly because we're in education or partly because we're advising policymakers who want answers, is part of the problem that we sort of feel we have to give answers and would it be better just to be critical, as you were, Phil, many years in, in your in you know your early stuff on publishing in the third world was all was very critical of of the publishing industry and, and science industry. So there, a question. Who wants yeah. to go first? Yeah, well, you want to go first? Oh, oh. just one, one uh, two sentences. Uh, to to the first question, um, the the answer is how we can best. Uh, uh, internationalize from the sort of northern, uh, western, whatever point of view, decommercialize it. That's all. Just start with that. Decommercialize internationalization. That would cause a revolution, but it's a revolution which we need. And the other, the other uh, really quick response to David is, I hope I'm still doing that. Um, I don't advise governments. And I still try to be critical. And uh, there we are, Hans. Yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, indeed 
uh, on the first question, uh, it's very important that we uh, focus much more on service to society and internationalization. So that's indeed uh, going away from revenue generation and uh, uh, being uh, moving up to the rankings, all those kinds of, uh, of criteria that we have. We have to see, well, this planet is in danger in all kinds of aspects. And if we not focus both higher education in general and internationalization of higher education on how to save the planet, then we are doing something wrong. And that means that we, in all kinds of aspects, including mobility, uh, we have to address those issues. We should be much more restrictive in moving. Uh, uh, we can do a lot of things. I will not say that having sometimes communities, as last week we had this conference and we had this very uh, active and engaged uh, group of scholars on international higher education together in Boston. We should continue to do that, but not in a massive way. We can do webinars like this uh, as well as an alternative. We, uh, we should not go for uh, uh, administrative meetings always to kind of big conferences every year. We can maybe do that every other year or something like that. Uh, but we also have to do it in many other aspects. And so that's important to me. And we have to keep the channels open. We should not be going in isolation. Uh, stay in the Western European or the Northern Hemisphere, but work together with colleagues in, in, in Asia, work together with colleagues in Africa and Latin America. And be, as David said, continue to be critical. We have to have a critical voice and we should not focus. That was also an important topic in our conference in Boston. Forget about uh, the semantic discussions about what internationalization is or uh, labeling it, uh, but do some things in a critical way to understand that we if we don't solve our problems in our own work, then uh, we don't get a step further. And we should be always, that has been the mission of the center during our 28 years that we exist. We have to have a critical evidence-based, but critical perspective of what we're doing in higher education in the world. Well, thank you both. And thanks to, to both questioners as well. I think we've got time for another two questions at least. And so I'd like to invite uh, Jiaraj uh, John Seka, and followed by uh, Shioli uh, Jing. Um, so, Jiaraj. Hello? Jiaraj, are you there? Will you come in, please? Jiaraj John Seka. I think, Shioli, you're going to get the chance to ask your question first. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, uh, Phil and uh, Hass, for your insightful presentation. Uh, uh, I'm very impressed by Hass the argument that uh, internationalization and, uh, abroad is more driven big agenda than internationalization at home. But I think considering the uh, reality, um, due to the decoupling between the US and China or more broadly the West and China, uh, while our Chinese government want to promote internationalization abroad, but it is rather difficult for us to like send the students uh, to these countries um, since they refuse to issue in their visas and they refuse to uh, cooperate in certain areas. So uh, facing this reality, should we promote internationalization at home instead? Is it possible without the support of, uh, of the Western world? So do you have any suggestions for us? Thank you. Now, I'll, I'll bring in the second questioner at this point as well. And I noticed that on my call list, Olgan is next. Olgan, are you there, please? Hello, Olgan. I did send the message in the chat quite late because we missed out on Jaj Araj. Olgan? Um, I'm going to go Hi. down. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm here. I'm I'm walking at the same time. Oh, yeah. It was a comment rather than a question, to be honest. And thanks for all these insightful sharings uh, by the colleagues. I do agree, and my comment was about these international students and push back towards them. Uh, my comment was, if you do that for students, it means you might be doing this for international scholars, which is really no good. Uh, for the institutions of the country, rather than taking this as a threat, we could use the advantage and uh, get the benefit of internationalization by all means. However, the government or the higher education uh, ecosystem can find the framework and 
uh, set the ground for that and take the privilege. So that was my uh, argument and, and comment. Thank you. Colleagues? Uh, yeah, let me start with the first question. I, I mean, first of all, and that also relates to the second point, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm not against uh, mobility of students. I think mobility of students is uh, an important dimension of higher education. They have the opportunity to learn from other contexts, etc. So I'm very much in favor of uh, mobility of students, but we have to do it in an uh, inclusive way and an ethically correct way. Uh, but so uh, internationalization at home and internationalization abroad are not two conflicting sides. They should be both part. Uh, and that's why the, uh, the definition of uh, 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 but the list of internationalization curriculum includes mobility as an option, how to internationalize the curriculum. Uh, it's an important part. So, but what we see is that the trend is much more uh, to, uh, to see mobility as something uh, separate from the, the teaching and learning side and the curriculum. We have to integrate it as part of it and then also address the very large percentage of students around the world, uh, we're talking about globally one to 2% of the students only have the possibility to go mobile. So we talk about 98% of students who are not having the possibility to go abroad. They still need to have basic understanding of the international dimension, intercultural dimensions of their, uh, their teaching and learning. If they don't understand that the world is connected and that you'd have to know what is happening elsewhere in the world and how the different perceptions of the profession of the the, the research etc are done then you miss something fundamentally and that's what uh, i think that's why it's so important that we have in addition to a study abroad experience we have in particular to have a much more internationalized curriculum at home for all students and for all faculty and that makes it still indeed very important that we have uh, both international students and international faculty uh, as part of it, but, uh, as part of our teaching and learning, because that makes a much more rich environment to teaching and learning. If we would have only local students and local faculty, then those students will not have that experience. So we have to try to do that and we can do it much better because we can bring in the virtual dimension into the teaching and learning side. We can bring students and faculty together inside the classroom and outside the classroom by social media, uh, by the internet to really to learn together and to understand the, uh, the, together in a much more effective way by uh, virtual exchange and collaborative online international learning as a new tool. So let's not see the digitalization in that sense as an enemy, but as an opportunity for internationalizing our uh, teaching and learning. Yeah, and just one brief comment, because we are at the end of our time. Um, uh, we haven't focused much on um, uh, on uh, faculty and science mobility. And I think that's very important uh, in a globalized science world and can play, can and should and does play an important role. So postdocs, international postdocs are important, visiting faculty arrangements and so on. And we shouldn't forget that too. Well, I want to thank you both um, for a great webinar. And I think that this will be watched a lot on YouTube. Um, that really full of insight and full of ideas and full of facts, uh, which people will draw on repeatedly, I'm sure. I want to apologize to Armagan Edogan. Uh, you would have been our next questioner if we had another batch of questions. Um, Jim McKinlay has made some very interesting comments in the chat. I particularly draw your attention to his first comment. Uh, and the last one, it, it's they're they're very useful. So if you've got a, a few seconds to do so, scroll um, and look for Jim in the chat and and see what he said. We'll also, of course, the uh, have access to the ch to the chat. It will be posted along with the um, the webinar recording uh, early next week. Um, I want to thank also Dong Mei um, Dong Mei Lee who made some interesting comments. Clearly, we we could run this webinar over twice the length of time, and we would have much more discussion. I'll, more than 140 people tuned in today, which now for our program is quite a large number. And I'm sure that's uh, a tribute both to the importance of the topic and the stature of our of our two presenters. Thanks very much, uh, Phil and Hans. I really appreciate you taking time in what for you is now a busy teaching schedule in Dublin to appear in the webinar. And we look forward to sharing your thoughts with you again in future uh, webinars um, in this program. 
colleagues, the next uh, webinar in our sequence, which is on Thursday this week, is on higher education and the regional dimension in England. Now, you might think we're being parochial going back to the UK after such a broad ranging webinar today, but let me tell you, this is a very interesting and important webinar. Um, uh, Mike Shadock and Nico Hulvath are going to put forward a proposition, which I think will carry a lot of weight to radically decentralize higher education policy and programs and funding in England um, away from the highly centralized Westminster um, model currently, which has really been the, the dominant model since the Second World War and towards much more regionally centered and collaborative, uh, collaborative with, with other tertiary institutions type of approach to higher education. So the big research universities, along with the rest, working regionally uh, as well as working nationally and globally. Um, so that'll be very interesting. And we look forward to your participation, all of you in next, next Thursday's webinar and also future webinars. Once again, thanks very much to Hans and Phil, really valued your comments today. And to everyone, it's bye for now.